This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This month, I'm detailing crimes that took place over the holidays. On this episode, I'll share a case of multiple murder that began with a violence-fueled spree on New Year's Day, 2006. For many people around the world, ringing in the new year brings with it the promise of new hope, a fresh start, and renewed possibilities. But each year of Ricky Gray's short life brought only violence, brutality, and death. By the time he was 39 years old, he found himself strapped to a gurney in a Virginia execution chamber waiting for the sweet release of death after being convicted of a series of horrific murders 10 years earlier. But even a supposedly painless state-sponsored death brought Gray no relief. Instead, it's alleged that he died a slow, torturous death ending in excruciating pain and some said it was no less than he deserved. This is a story you won't soon forget. This is the case of the Richmond, Virginia, New Year's murder spree. It's hard to imagine losing a loved one, a wife, a husband, a child. For many, it's their biggest fear. From Wondery, The Vanished is a podcast that tells the stories of often overlooked and unsolved missing persons cases. Every week, host Marissa Jones dives into a new case, sharing the details of their mysterious disappearance from interviews with family, friends, law enforcement, and even suspects in an effort to reveal the truth. The Vanished has even aided in getting long overdue arrests through their in-depth interviews. Marissa reminds listeners of the human behind the headline and aims to help family members find their vanished loved one, or at least a sense of peace. I've been a fan of The Vanished since it first launched around the same time I began producing episodes of Once Upon a Crime. I consider Marissa a friend, and I'm so impressed by her research of these important cases, her dedication to helping the families of missing people get answers, and she has one of the best voices in the business. Listen to The Vanished, and I know you'll become as big a fan as I am. Follow The Vanished on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Ricky Javon Gray and Ray Joseph Dandridge separately were troubled men, but together they were chaos. Ray's father would say, any time they got together, they would get in trouble. It seems they influenced each other. They raised hell together. Gray was Dandridge's uncle. His older sister was Ray's mother. But the two were almost the exact same age, born just a couple of months apart. So while they were technically uncle and nephew, they grew up more like brothers. As kids, they played together and spent nights sleeping over at each other's houses in Arlington, Virginia. Both were high school dropouts, although Gray would briefly transfer to a military academy in Woodstock, Virginia. At the age of 18, Gray and Dandridge were arrested together and charged with armed robbery. They had committed a series of holdups, targeting college students, stealing small amounts of cash, laptops, and backpacks. Dandridge was convicted of robbery with the use of a handgun and sentenced to 11 years in prison. Gray was also convicted of robbery and sentenced to four years, but was released in three. Gray's freedom was short-lived when he was arrested on drug charges in 2000 and pled guilty to conspiracy to distribute cocaine. In September 2000, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Once again, he caught a break. When the prosecutor asked for a reduced sentence for the convicted felon, citing, quote, substantial assistance to prosecutors. I can only guess that he provided information to help bring charges against higher-level drug dealers, although this is not specifically stated in the record. He was released in January 2005, 
after serving just half of his original 10-year sentence. While in prison, Gray began corresponding with a mother of four named Treva Terrell. Treva had served time in jail in Alexandria in 2002. While participating in a work release program as part of her sentence, she was sexually assaulted by a sheriff's deputy who ran the program. She would later testify in court against the officer. Upon her release from jail, Treva moved to be closer to her family in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When Ricky Gray was released in January 2005, he also moved to Pittsburgh. Treva helped him get on his feet by recommending him for a job at a telemarketing company where she worked. Gray also enrolled in electrician school. Just months after his release, Treva announced to her family that she and Gray had married. Gray was 28 and Treva 35. Treva's mother rented the newly married couple a house that she owned. Things should have been looking up for Ricky Gray after his early release from prison, but he and his new bride fought and argued often. It appeared that the marriage was falling apart as quickly as it had come together. Gray's nephew and ride or die, Ray Dandridge, was released from prison on October 2005 after serving 10 years. He quickly reconnected with Gray. Dandridge's father, Ronald Wilson, tried to help his son transition from prison, giving him the opportunity to flip houses with him. Wilson would find and purchase rundown homes in Philadelphia, renovate them, and sell them for a profit. I was trying to get him started on the right track, Wilson said. Then they got together. Dandridge soon chose to follow his newly married uncle, Ray, to Pittsburgh. Ten days after Dandridge moved to Pittsburgh, Treva Terrell Gray's body was found. She had been beaten to death and her body hastily buried in a gravel lot outside of town. Police considered her death suspicious, and her mother reported seeing large scratches on her husband's arms the day she disappeared. However, inexplicably, her death wouldn't be investigated as a homicide, until Gray and Dandridge were suspected in seven other murders. On New Year's Eve 2005, 26-year-old Ryan Carey arrived at his parents' home on North 25th Street in Arlington, Virginia. Ricky Gray and Ray Dandridge saw the young man and chose him at random to rob. They took Kerry by surprise and forced him to the ground and stabbed him multiple times in the chest, neck, and arms. As the man screamed and fought for his life, they attempted to slit his throat. Kerry was able to break away and run towards the house. Gray and Dandridge fled. Kerry collapsed in the entryway where his father discovered him covered in blood and called for an ambulance. He would spend two months in the hospital and also lose the use of his right arm as a result of the attack. It's unknown why Gray and Dandridge, after Carrie's attack, decided to travel two hours south to continue their violence-fueled robbery spree in Richmond, Virginia. But on January 1st, just hours after the ball dropped in Times Square, ringing in 2006, the duo drove into the Woodland Heights neighborhood, known as one of the safest and most peaceful places to live in Virginia. Driving down 31st Street, they noticed the open front door of one of the well-kept homes. Gray's current girlfriend, Ashley Baskerville, age 21, was driving the car when Gray directed her to pull over. The home that had caught their attention belonged to the Harvey family. 49-year-old Brian Harvey and his wife, 39-year-old Catherine, had been coming in and out of the house all morning preparing to host their annual New Year's Day party and had left the door ajar while doing so. The Harveys were a well-known couple in Richmond. Brian Harvey worked as a computer technician for the Henrico County School District, but had played guitar and sang in several rock bands over the years. His latest band, House of Freaks, had recorded two albums and were a popular club band on the East Coast. Catherine owned a local business, a toy store called World of Mirth. Catherine's brother, Stephen Culp, was an actor who appeared in the television series Desperate Housewives and JAG, and movies including James and the Giant Peach and Captain America Winter Soldier. 
The Harveys had two children, Stella, age nine, and Ruby, age four. Gray and Dandridge walked into the Harvey home and first came upon Brian Harvey. They ordered him to the ground and grabbed four-year-old Ruby, who was nearby playing with the puzzle. At knife point, they directed Brian and his daughter into the kitchen. In the kitchen, Catherine was cutting up vegetables. Gray grabbed the knife she was using and told them all to, quote, behave. He said they were only going to rob them, and then they'd leave as long as the Harveys didn't give them any trouble. The couple complied, while at the same time trying to keep their frightened four-year-old calm. The men forced the family into the basement, where they tied up Brian first, then his wife and daughter. As Gray remained in the basement to watch over the family, Dandridge went through the house to round up anything of value. While he was upstairs, Dandridge saw a woman and two children walking up to the Harvey's front door. He ran downstairs to report this to Gray, just as a knock was heard at the door. Catherine Harvey explained it was a neighbor bringing her nine-year-old daughter Stella home from a sleepover. The other little girl with the woman was Stella's friend. Gray untied Catherine and told her to get rid of the woman. He threatened the lives of Brian and Ruby if she tried anything to tip the woman off. Catherine went upstairs and answered the door. Before she could react, Stella ran past her. The other little girl attempted to follow Stella into the house, but Catherine stopped her. She told the neighbor that she wasn't feeling well to get her to leave quickly. Gray and Dandridge now tied up all four members of the Harvey family and taped Brian's mouth shut. They retreated to another part of the basement and discussed what to do. They decided to kill the family because, as they later explained, they had seen their faces and could identify them. Catherine, who was trying to comfort her distraught daughters, pleaded with the men to just take whatever they wanted and leave. Something set Gray off in that moment, and he pulled out the knife and sliced Catherine across the throat multiple times while her horrified family looked on. The wounds were immediately fatal, so Gray continued stabbing her in the back and chest as she tried to get away. He then moved towards Brian and tried to saw at his throat with a knife, cutting him eight times. The knife wounds both Brian and Catherine received would have been extremely painful, but did not kill them. They continued to fight for their lives until Gray picked up a claw hammer that was lying nearby and began striking them in their heads. Both Catherine and Brian would die from blunt force injuries to their skulls. I won't go into detail about the violence that was perpetrated upon the two little girls. I find it very disturbing, although the details have been shared widely in news articles and in the court records. You can find them easily if you're so inclined. I will just tell you that they did not die easy deaths. Gray didn't spare the children any of the brutality he had subjected their parents to, and both of the girls died from blunt force injuries and stab wounds. Smoke inhalation and carbon monoxide poisoning also contributed to four-year-old Ruby's death. Before leaving the house, Gray and Dandridge broke open some wine bottles, and Gray poured the alcohol over an easel found in the basement. He then lit it on fire before he and Dandridge left. The total haul from the robbery was the Harvey's wedding rings, a Christmas basket, a plate of cookies, and a laptop computer. Tired of the same old game nights? Looking for a fun new activity to wow your family with over the holidays? Then Hunt a Killer is for you. Each box is a complete murder mystery you have to solve. Perfect for all you true crime fans out there. You're the detective. You get all the evidence and you go at your own pace to figure out who the killer is. Each box comes with a variety of tangible clues to help you solve the mystery. For example, in my first Hunt a Killer box, I got maps, letters, geographical and historical information, everything I needed to take my game night to the next level. And I'm telling you, these items in the box are realistic, feel authentic, and are super cool. Trust me, you'll want to keep them as a souvenir for yourself when you're done playing. You can pick from standalone single crime cases, multi-chapter mystery boxes, 
or an exclusive monthly subscription storyline that unfolds over six months. Games ship out quarterly, so you'll get three chapters of the game delivered every three months. So many different scenarios to choose from. For the month of December, Hunt a Killer has special promotions like $99 box sets, 20 to 50% off premium single case boxes, and huge discounts on subscription plans. Great ways to give a unique gift to that true crime fanatic or mystery lover. They'll be thrilled. Head over to Hunt a Killer at huntakiller.com slash once and use once to take advantage of the killer discounts and limited edition merchandise during their month of mystery. That's huntakiller.com slash once and use code once. At just before 2 p.m., Brian Harvey's friend and bandmate, John Hot arrived at their home for their New Year's Day party. He noticed smoke coming from the house and ran next door to call 911. When the fire was extinguished, the Harvey family was found dead, bound and gagged in the basement. Firefighters alerted the police. The public was shocked and alarmed that such brutal and seemingly motiveless murders had taken place in their close-knit community. The Harveys were well-liked and without enemies. And who could perpetrate such violence on two innocent little girls? It was all too much to fathom. Residents of Woodland Heights, who'd rarely locked their doors before the murders, now installed more locks and added security systems as well, anything that could help them sleep at night. Police had no suspects, and residents were terrified that the killer or killers could still be nearby and were a threat to their families. And indeed, the murderers had not gone far. Ricky Gray's girlfriend, Ashley Baskerville, had served as their getaway driver. Ashley had grown up just south of Richmond, Virginia, in Chesterfield County. She had also lived outside of the law as a youth. She had been in and out of juvenile detention facilities since the age of 12. Ashley had recently been released again and was now trying to make a fresh start in her life. She'd returned to South Richmond and was living with her mother and stepfather, Mary and Percy L. Tucker. She began attending church with her mother and joined a prison ministry group. Then Ashley met Ricky Gray. The promise of easy money, and perhaps excitement, must have drawn her to the ex-con, and she joined him and his cousin in committing robberies. Reports of the murders at the Harvey home were all over the local news cycle, and images of the house she had waited outside of in the getaway car flashed across the television screen. Ashley had to know that her boyfriend had crossed over from petty crime to homicide. Still, she continued on in the relationship. Ashley also introduced a girl she'd grown up with and whom she'd recently reconnected to Gray's nephew, Ray Dandridge. Latoya Polly was also just 21 years old and lived with her mother in Chesterfield County when she was introduced to Dandridge. She liked the quiet young man who appeared to let his young uncle take the lead in most things. Latoya began a relationship with Ray. On New Year's Day, Latoya asked her mother, Lillian Polly, who everyone called Miss Lily, if she could invite her friends to the house to hang out. Latoya was referring to her friend Ashley, Ashley's boyfriend Ricky Gray, and Latoya's new love interest, Ray Dandridge. Miss Lily told her daughter no in no uncertain terms. She was tired after having attended a New Year's Eve party at her brother's home the night before. She didn't want to have to entertain people, especially strangers, in her home on New Year's Day. Lily Polly left her home for a short time to purchase some groceries, and when she returned, two men who were strangers to her emerged from her house and offered to help bring in her groceries. While she didn't appreciate her daughter's disregard of her wish not to have visitors, she found Gray and Dandridge polite and helpful. She was also surprised when she found a gift they had brought for her. A plate of chocolate chip cookies was sitting on her dresser wrapped in cellophane. Of course, she didn't know that they had come from the home of the Harvey family and that these men were responsible for their murders. Ricky Gray was the most talkative. He told Miss Lily that he went by the nickname Cooley and that Ray was actually his nephew even though they were both 28. Ray Dandridge was the more quiet and reserved of the pair and he seemed to really care for her daughter. He called Latoya Boo and treated her respectfully, which Miss Lily appreciated. However, she didn't like Ricky's girlfriend, Ashley. Miss Lily was acquainted with Ashley Baskerville since she and Latoya had gone to school together. 
Ashley and her daughter weren't close friends, but they had known each other for many years. But in her opinion, her daughter's friend was a loudmouth and disrespectful. The next day, January 2nd, Ashley, Ricky, and Ray returned to Miss Lily's house. She was taking care of her five-year-old grandson, and Ashley had come to pick up LaToya so they could have their hair done in town. To Miss Lily's dismay, Ricky and Ray stayed behind after the girls left for their appointment. Something about these two men set off Miss Lily's alarm bells, even though they appeared to be well-mannered. They showered attention on her grandson, calling him Little Man, but she didn't like them around the boy. She took her grandson into her bedroom and kept the door closed until LaToya returned. Don't leave me with them, she whispered to her. LaToya told her mother that she and Ashley were going out with the guys that night. Miss Lily urged her to stay home, but LaToya said they were just going to dinner and would be back soon. When LaToya returned, she was alone. She told her mother that the men had driven around the neighborhood looking for a house to rob. They had asked LaToya if she knew anyone who had any money, and she told them that she didn't. Miss Lily told her daughter she didn't want the men in her house anymore, and she straight up banned Ashley from stepping foot into her home. But Miss Lily was too afraid to turn the men away when they simply walked into her house the next morning. Ashley, no longer allowed in the home, stayed outside in Gray's van. LaToya went out to the vehicle to talk to her. Ashley had a laptop open, and LaToya saw photos on the screen, a white family opening gifts on Christmas. She recognized the faces of the parents. It was the Harvey family, who had been found murdered in their home just two days earlier. Ashley was deleting the photos from the laptop. LaToya realized immediately that the laptop must belong to the victims of that terrible crime. She went back inside and motioned her mother into the bedroom. LaToya whispered, Mom, don't panic. You can't panic. I think they killed the Harvey people. Miss Lily's first reaction was to panic, but LaToya told her that their lives depended on them keeping it together, so as not to let Gray and Dandridge know what they suspected. The women were too afraid to call the police, fearing that if Gray and Dandridge found out, they would kill them. They decided to stay silent in hopes that the men would soon leave. In the meantime, they would try not to anger them in any way. Gray had heard that Miss Lily was a great cook and asked her what she was making for dinner. She said she was making a chicken pot pie. Gray said he'd never eaten chicken pot pie. He also asked if she knew how to make sweet potato pie. He said he'd always wanted to taste one. Miss Lily answered, yes, of course, but said she also wondered, quote, what black person has never had chicken pot pie or tasted a sweet potato pie, end quote. She found it odd. But now, wanting to stay on Gray's good side, she baked a sweet potato pie for him. But Gray became angry and impatient when the pie was ready and Miss Lily took out a plastic knife to cut it with. She later stated that there was no way she was going to give the suspected murderer a sharp knife. When Gray couldn't cut the pie easily, he snapped at Miss Lily saying the knife was, quote, no good for cutting this pie. She handed him the pie still in the pan, telling Gray he could take the whole thing. The Polly women also realized that several gifts the men had given them had probably come from the Harvey's house, or perhaps other robberies they'd committed. This included a video game they had given her grandson and a DVD player. But LaToya grew more nervous as the days ticked by, and Dandridge and Gray kept asking her about an income tax refund check she had foolishly let slip she was waiting for. She and her mother thought that it was possible that the only reason Gray and Dandridge hadn't killed them was because they had nothing for the men to steal. Miss Lily was on edge because she knew that she had over $1,000 in cash socked away in a dresser drawer. On January 3rd, Gray, Dandridge, and Ashley drove around the block and robbed an elderly couple in their home. Roy Mason was home with his wife when the two men barged in after knocking on the door to ask for directions. They pushed the 75-year-old man down on a couch and then gathered up a television set, DVD player, a computer, and $800 in cash. 
Mason had just cashed in his Social Security check that morning. Halfway through the robbery, Ashley Baskerville walked into the house and took a video game. Gray and Dandridge told Mason that they were going to tie him and his wife up before leaving. Mason thought he could reason with the robbers because they had been polite, saying yes sir and no sir when addressing him. Mason asked them to please not tie them up because his wife was very ill and if she needed him, he wouldn't be able to help her. To his surprise, the men agreed and left the home without harming them. Are you shopping online this Black Friday or Cyber Monday? This year, you need to make sure you add Parade to the list. Going to the mall to try on bras and underwear during Black Friday is a nightmare you no longer need to worry about. If you're worried about sizing, Parade has a find your bra size quiz so you can find your size without even having to leave your bed. Shop this sale season in ease with Parade's 70% off the entire site limited time promotion, with 50% off for orders of $250 and above, 40% off for orders of $125 and up, and 30% off all orders. With my promo code, you can take up to 70% off plus a free gift with purchase when you use BF once at checkout. Some of Parade's popular products have even gone viral on TikTok, like their super soft sleep pants, my favorite, and their smoothing nearly naked seamless bodysuit. It's the most flattering bodysuit at a better price and sustainable. And Parade's underwear and PJs are the stocking stuffers that won't disappoint. I know what I'm getting the gals in my family for Christmas. Plus, I love that Parade creates styles ranging from extra small to 3XL, so you can find something for all shapes and sizes. Join the Parade and get sustainable creative basics that prioritize comfort and quality. Take up to 70% off plus a free gift with purchase when you use BF once at checkout. Welcome to the Parade, an underwear story that represents you. Lily and LaToya Polly had been sitting on pins and needles for six days as the two men they suspected of being murderers came and went from their home. Finally, on January 6th, the men announced that they were leaving for Philadelphia. Ashley was going with them. They said they'd be back in a couple of weeks. They were more than a little relieved when the trio drove off in Ricky's van, but they were concerned about what the men were planning next. Latoya had heard them talking about robbing Ashley's mother and stepfather. Ashley didn't like her stepfather and had agreed to the plan. But Dandridge had shared more details with Latoya, information she wasn't sure she believed 100%. She thought maybe he was exaggerating when he confided to her that Ricky was thinking about killing Ashley. At least she hoped he was exaggerating. Why, Latoya asked. Dandridge said that Ashley was always nagging Gray to get more money, and he was getting sick of her. So when Dandridge called LaToya on the evening of January 6th, just hours after they'd left her home, she asked about Ashley. What he said next made the hair stand up on the back of her neck. Ashley gone bye-bye, Dandridge said. After they hung up, LaToya tried repeatedly to reach Ashley by cell phone, but her phone just continued ringing with no answer. She decided to call the police. She reported all she knew about Ricky Gray and Ray Dandridge and where they were headed. She said she was concerned for her friend, Ashley Baskerville. Latoya agreed to let the police tap her cell phone. When Dandridge called her later that night, his call was recorded. Dandridge said that he and Gray had tied up the Baskerville family. And what did you do? Latoya asked. Dandridge answered, Can't say that on the phone, boo. Officers rushed to the Baskerville home, which was just five minutes away from the Polly house. But by the time they arrived, Ashley lay dead on a bedroom floor, a sock in her mouth and a plastic grocery bag tied tightly around her head and bound with duct tape. She had suffocated to death. Also found were Ashley's parents. 47-year-old Mary Baskerville Tucker had a gag in her mouth and her eyes had been duct taped. She had been stabbed in the chest, but had died as a result of suffocation. Ashley's stepfather, 55-year-old Percy L. Tucker's autopsy, would reveal that his head had been covered with plastic wrap 
after a sock had been stuffed inside his mouth and duct taped shut. He had also suffocated to death. The men had stolen Perciel's 1993 Chevy Blazer and were headed to Philadelphia. Speaking about her friend Ashley, Latoya Polly said, quote, she dug a hole for her family and she fell in it right along with them. Investigators traced a phone number Dandridge had called Latoya from to a home in West Philadelphia. On the morning of January 7th, just one week after the murder spree began, Gray and Dandridge were taken into custody. Gray was found hiding in a basement behind a water heater. When officers attempted to arrest him, he refused to show one of his hands, punched one officer, assaulted a second officer, and attempted to take his gun. The officers exchanged blows with Gray until he was subdued and taken into custody. Miss Lilly and Latoya Pauly were taken to a motel in the city where they remained for their protection. The holidays are here, people, and with all the chaos and mayhem that comes with the holidays, don't you feel you sometimes need some well-deserved me time? Bring back that holiday joy to your life by playing Best Fiends. Best Fiends is an exciting free-to-download puzzle adventure game that you can play anytime, anywhere. No kidding, you can play anywhere with offline mode. I can easily pull out my phone and play while I'm waiting in those long lines at the grocery store, in the mall, are waiting for my guests to arrive for holiday dinners. I'm loving all these new holiday characters and themes, and I'm so close to cracking level 520. Give yourself the gift of fun. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Ricky Gray and Ray Dandridge were arrested in Philadelphia, suspected of killing seven people in less than a week. Both men almost immediately confessed to the crimes. Dandridge attempted to minimize his responsibility in the Baskerville Tucker murders by saying it was Ray's idea to murder Ashley and rob her parents. He did confess to suffocating the family and provided details, including the fact that Ashley was killed last. Ray and Dandridge soon became suspects in the Harvey family murders. Catherine Harvey's unique wedding ring, one designed by her husband specifically for her, was found on Ashley's finger. Brian Harvey's ring and the family's laptop were found among Gray's possessions. Gray confessed to killing the four members of the Harvey family as well as the three additional murders of Ashley Baskerville and Mary and Percy L. Tucker. When asked why he killed the Harveys and why he felt the need to kill the children, Gray answered, quote, how am I supposed to explain something like what happened? I started cutting their throats, and they kept getting up, and they were scaring me. I remembered seeing the hammer and picking it up, and then I was just hitting them all with the hammer. All I know is nobody was moving when I left there. End quote. He also confessed to the murder of his wife, Treva Terrell, and the attack on Ryan Carey. He offered as a motivation for his wife's murder how she kept talking about being raped while in jail. He said he, quote, couldn't handle it, so he killed her. He and Dandridge were also tied to the robbery of the elderly couple, the Masons. Ricky Gray was charged with five counts of capital murder and Dandridge with three counts of capital murder. On August 6, 2006, Ricky Gray's trial began. After all the evidence, including his confession, was presented to the jury, they took just 30 minutes to find Gray guilty on all charges. The jury recommended the death penalty. The following month, Ray Dandridge's case was heard. He had pled not guilty, but before closing arguments were presented, he changed his plea to guilty to avoid the death penalty. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole and is serving his sentence at Sussex State Prison in Virginia. In October, Ricky Gray's sentencing hearing was held. His sister testified about the abuse her brother had been subjected to as a child, both sexual and physical. However, this did little to sway the jury's opinion that Gray should receive the maximum penalty, and he was sentenced to death. But when Gray's sentence was appealed, 
His attorneys argued that not enough evidence of his history as a victim of sexual abuse and subsequent drug use was presented during the sentencing trial. In 2016, they petitioned the governor to commute Gray's sentence to life in prison. To make their case, they provided specific details of a horrific childhood filled with abuse, violence, and degradation that they described as sexual slavery. Gray experienced sexual abuse from the time he was seven or eight years old, the affidavits filed with the appeals court stated. His father ran a brothel, and Gray was repeatedly raped by female sex workers who were employed there, according to one report. Gray's father administered vicious beatings to his son on a frequent basis. A psychiatrist wrote that these beatings were, quote, such an inescapable part of Gray's life that, like the sexual abuse, he retains vivid sensory memories of both the pain they produced and the objects that his father used to inflict the pain. Beginning at the age of nine and continuing for several years, Ricky Gray was repeatedly raped by his older half-brother. The psychiatrist who interviewed Gray and filed his report with the appeals court stated that, quote, the rapes were so pervasive, so frequent, and over such a long period of time that they can only be described as sexual slavery, end quote. Sights, sounds, smells, and tastes all trigger memories of sexual abuse, the doctor stated. The sight of striped socks are a trigger for Gray. This was the specific item used by his brother on him to muffle his screams of pain. The sound of static from a television set also brought on flashbacks of Gray's sexual abuse. The TV always remained on while he was being assaulted. To numb the horrors of his childhood, Gray began using drugs as early as age nine. He first took to smoking marijuana at age nine and PCP at age 11 or 12. A neuropharmacologist from Duke University also filed an affidavit in which he stated that he'd never before heard of someone at such a young age using PCP. He explained that the drug can induce psychotic symptoms that would be equivalent to getting drunk, taking hallucinogens, and amphetamines all at once. Gray stated during his confession that he was, quote, high as a kite during the murders and didn't have full memory of the crimes he committed. Even though the court agreed that Ricky Gray's early life was the stuff of nightmares and certainly contributed to his mental state and violent crimes, it was not swayed to commute his sentence. The U.S. Supreme Court also declined to hear his case, and his execution was scheduled for January 18, 2017. The day before Gray was set to die, he issued an apology to his victims' families and everyone affected by his crimes. Quote, I've stolen something from the world. It's never left my mind because I understand exactly what I took from the world by looking at my two sisters. I'm reminded each time I talk and see them that this is what I took from the world. You know, the potential for greatness in those kids. I'm sorry they had to be a victim of my despair. Well, I can hope that they'd be willing to accept my deepest apology, end quote. The following day, Ricky Gray was led into the death chamber at Greensville Correctional Center. He was to die by lethal injection. But according to his attorneys, something went very wrong after he was injected with a legal drug cocktail that is said to bring on a quick, painless death. Gray's execution took more than 30 minutes and was not conducted in front of witnesses, as is the usual protocol. When the Virginia Department of Corrections was asked for an explanation by Gray's attorneys, they released a statement claiming that the delay was caused due to the difficulty of inserting the intravenous line. But Gray's attorneys disputed this claim, saying that his veins had been examined multiple times in the days leading up to his execution. Quote, He was a healthy 39-year-old man and did not have any medical condition or history, such as intravenous drug use, would indicate potential problems, the attorneys stated. One of Gray's attorneys, Elizabeth Pfeiffer, was a witness to the execution, and said that she was unable to view her client as he was hidden behind a curtain for several minutes as the IV was being inserted. She stated that once the curtain was opened and the drugs were administered, she observed Gray, quote, breathing laboriously, gasping, snorting, and making movements, end quote. She also stated that when he was given a pinch test for pain and to gauge whether he was still conscious, he turned his head from side to side. 
Gray's attorneys believe that he may have been suffocating after being injected with the drug midazolam or may have been reacting to the second or third drugs used during the execution, which they described as causing, quote, excruciating pain. Mark Heath, an anesthesiologist at Columbia University, agreed that the description of Gray's movements seemed consistent with the reaction to a high dose of midazolam that depresses but does not fully eliminate respiratory function. The body attempts to inhale, but the brain is not aware of the struggle. He stated that while the second and third drugs in the lethal injection cocktail, quote, can be excruciatingly painful, he disagreed that Gray's reactions signaled that he felt any pain or discomfort. Gray was the first prisoner to be executed in Virginia using midazolam. The drug has been implicated in several executions that were said to be prolonged and apparently painful. It has been taken out of the use for executions in some states. However, in March of 2021, Virginia became the first southern state in the United States to abolish the death penalty. Virginia carried out a record number of executions before the practice was abolished, second only to Texas. Ricky Gray was the second to the last man put to death in a Virginia prison before capital punishment was abolished. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. That was quite an intense case, and I have a few thoughts and theories that came up while I was researching it. I've shared my thoughts on Patreon. If you want to hear that bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. When you become a patron of the show, you'll get ad-free early release versions of all episodes, as well as bonus episodes you can't hear anywhere else. Memberships start at just $2 a month, and you'll even get some cool gifts sent to you for joining. Next month, you'll have an extra special episode, something that I get a request for the most, a case discussion with my sister Yolanda. If you listen to the other episodes we've done together in the past, the Scott Peterson case, the Darley Routier case, and enjoyed them, then you won't want to miss December's bonus episode on Patreon. Get a link to sign up in the show notes. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Thanks for listening, and until next time, be good to one another.